Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very great day in Denia, Alicante, in Spain. I'm George Grishan. I'm with you. And the idea today is to talk with you about Bologna and about students and universities. Bologna Dotta, the learned Bologna. Bologna Dotta was uh, a definition coined by Dante. So we're talking about students, emperors, and popes. I'm George Grishan, inspired by Katerina Grishina. As you remember, together with our daughter, Paulina, together with our mom-in-law, we lived in Bologna for about a year, two years ago. Uh, we lived not far from this place, which is called Porta Maggiore, and then you have Strada Maggiore, a very central street, which goes towards uh, one of the tallest or the tallest tower in the town, the tower Asinelli. So let us take, about, uh, take you about uh, the town. Let us show you the town. But we are talking history. We are talking universities. If you remember Matilda of Tuscany with her friend Pope Gregory VII, were fighting or were struggling with emperors of the Salian dynasty. Henry IV, here he is, and Henry V. As you remember, Henry IV came in 1077 to Canossa, to ask the Pope for pardon. 11 years later, 1088, Matilda sent her own lawyers to Bologna to prove her rights for the lands. And there the university started. But we are now talking about the next dynasty. Henry IV and V were of Salian dynasty. And we are now talking about Hohenstaufens one of the brightest dynasties of, uh, Holy, of the emperors of Holy Roman Empire. And the most interesting emperors were Friedrich I and Friedrich II. Here they are. Fri I'm sorry, they're here. Friedrich I, Barbarossa, and Friedrich II. So we're talking about the period between 1152, when Friedrich I, Barbarossa, was elected uh, emperor, to 1250, Friedrich II died. Here they are the great dynasty of Hohenstaufens. Uh, they had a certain castle after which uh, the party was called Ghibellines, whilst the other dynasty, Welfs, were called and uh, they were supporting Pope, and the supporters of Popes were later on called Guelphs. Here we have Friedrich I, Barbarossa, and uh, Friedrich II, Stupor Mundi, the wonder of the world, a fantastic medieval emperor. What did they do for students? Because we're only talking Bologna University students. We're not that interested in the families. We have to do a kind of an investigation, just more or less retrace my steps a year ago, when I um, discovered something interesting uh, on the streets of Bologna. We start in the south, near San Procola, a church of San Procola and uh, uh, the Basilica of San Domenico. We go to the center of the town, of uh, the Piazza Maggiore, and then we go to the university district, passing by uh, two towers. That's the Bologna of something like 13th century. Have a look. Piazza Maggiore, one of the first, if not the first, squares, open squares, created in medieval Europe. This is San Domenico, a very important monastery. And this here, these are two towers, and this here is the university district. This is the view from the north. Uh, we go to San Procola, not far from San Domenico. San Pro Procola, the saint was he, he was a martyr, but he also was a soldier who became a martyr in 304 during uh, Diocletian, the Roman emperor. Uh, so he is the military patron saint of Bologna, as opposed to San Petronio, who is the, like, you know, the overall saint. What was interesting for me in San Procola, before going in, I noticed these two inscriptions, these two memorial plaques on the church. And actually, I came here to read this plaque, and then I discovered the other one, much bigger. We start with the smaller one. I think this is the funniest and the most strange inscription in the whole of Bologna. On the church of San Procola, it says, Si procol a proculo proculi campana fuiset, 
nuk prokola a prokolo prokolos ipse for it. What does this combination of strange combination of prokols mean? And this dates back to 1393. Actually, the legend says it's about a poor, hardworking student who was, uh, you know, learning, who was sitting on his books days and night, but he was living next to the San Procolo church. And San Procolo church had very, very loud bells, campani, and it actually says that if Procol, the student, lived further from San Procolo, the church, then he wouldn't be lying near that close to San Procolo. So he, let's say, he overstudied, and he simply died. There's another legend saying that uh, they were all, all actually talking about Bell Ringer, who was killed by a bell. Not saved by a bell, but killed by a bell. I don't know. I like the student history better. Also because the other inscription, the other plaque on San Procola is also about students. I started reading it, and then I realized later on that these famous four lawyers are not mentioned anywhere on the streets of Bologna. They're not mentioned too much in the history of Bologna. They were called Bulgaro, also was called by Irnerius, his teacher, the golden tongue or the golden mouth, Martino, Jacopo, and Ugo. All four were uh, students uh, of Irnerius, the one who founded the university. And the inscription says, that they were doctors of the studio of Bologna. Studio means university. And in 1158, they were called by Friedrich I Barbarossa to the Diet at Roncalia, where they helped to formulate the important decision as to how to share rights between empire and the cities. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the university? Let's go deeper. Diet means Reichstag or parliament. Friedrich I, when elected the emperor of the empire, and he was the first to actually call it the Holy Roman Empire. And we also remember that empire included lots of states in the modern Germany, and also quite a few, quite a big part of the Northern Italy, and also of the Southern Italy at some point of time. So he was elected uh, emperor in 1152. He couldn't get any money from the German kings or princes, and he went to Northern Italy, which already was getting richer and richer. You remember when uh, Matilda died, it uh, formed a vacuum, and uh, most of the cities or towns uh, started their own communas. They became absolutely independent, and they started to trade, and they started accumulating riches. So 1154, Friedrich I Barbarossa, with a red beard, Barbarossa, goes to the north of Italy and collects a parliament, or calls for the, the meeting of a parliament called Diet. And during four years, a number of decisions are taken, especially in 1158, which were to the detriment of the Northern Italian cities. Uh, he imposed taxes on them, he reduced their privileges, and after those uh, parliaments, the Italian uh, cities formed what was called the Lombard League, and 18 years later, in Lignana, in 1176, they defeated the troops of Friedrich I. Friedrich I left Italy forever in 1176 and started like a movement east. This is why Hitler, Adolf Hitler, called his plan of conquering the Soviet Union Barbarossa, because Barbarossa was the first emperor, let's say the first German ruler who actually started this gradual movement towards the Baltics, towards modern Poland, Prussia, and so forth. Why? Because he was defeated in Northern Italy by the Lombard League troops. But let's go back to 1158. Who actually gained from those di diets or diets, diets in Rancalia? Rancalia is not far away from the modern Piacenza, not far away from Milana, and so forth. So what were these four lawyers doing in these deaths? What they did was good or bad for their own town, for Bologna? This is Friedrich II. Friedrich I, I don't apologize. Friedrich I, Barbarossa. See the red beard. What it was. In 1158, 
the four lawyers from Bologna helped to adopt Authentica Habita, or Privilegium Scholasticum. Privilegium, these were privileges, these were rights granted by the Diet and the Emperor, Friedrich I, on to students. As far as giving them, providing them immunities and freedoms as those held by the clergy, freedom of movement and protection during travel to for the purposes of study immunity from the right of reprisal i.e property seizure and the right to be tried by clergy courts rather than by civil courts or town courts so students actually by the, that decision of 1158 became more important than cities could you imagine and it actually was uh, this authentic habitat in 1158, which gave the legal foundation for the existence of universities. Now let's have a walk. First, we go to San Domenica. San Domenica was a very important saint, one of the probably most famous saints in the medieval Europe, who died in Bologna in 1222. When you go inside the San Domenica Basilica, you will on the right you will see this arc this is sarcophag the tombstone of uh, san dominica uh, on which lots of important and famous sculptures and architects were working uh, including the very very young and unknown michelangelo buonarotti so i'm always asking what do you think one of the two angels who uh, which particular statue was made by michelangelo and also it's quite interesting that the statue of San Procola here was also made by Buonarroti. When you go for, further, on the left, you'll see the tomb of Re Enzo, the son of Friedrich II. We'll be speaking about him shortly. And when you go out, we were talking about uh, the tombstones of the glossatory of important uh, masters of law, teachers of law. And this glossatory, Rolandino, was famous for uh, having written the codex of the work of notaries, which was uh, used between uh, his death in 13th century and 17th or 18th century. For four or 500 years, the notaries were basing their work on the code done here and commemorated uh, here outside the San Dominica Cathedral. By the way, these tombstones, there are five of them in Bologna, they remember the shape of Helicarnas Mausoleum, one of seven, seven wonders of the ancient world. Okay, we go further. And we are passing Archigymnasia. Archigymnasia was the first building of the university in 1563. Why? It needed only no, nearly 500 years, nearly five centuries for the university to get its own building. Why? Because before that, the students were learning in professors' houses. The students were split into different sections, and then we're going to talk about these sections. But this building now is fantastic, Archigymnasia. It's next uh, to the San Petronius uh, Basilica, so the very center of the town. That's Galvani. Uh, this is the celebration of 800 years of the university, 1888. What the most striking feature of Archigymnasia are the coats of arms, the coats of arms of students, 6,000 of them. So you understand that students were not coming from very, very poor families. And of course, students were bringing lots of money for Bologna and for other university cities. The important parts of the Archigymnasia is this anatomical theater, all made in wood, absolutely fantastic and also Strabat or Stabat, I'm sorry, Stabat or Stabat Hall. Do you know what? There are only two halls for students and professors meetings in Archigymnasia. One for all faculties and the other one just for the faculty or for the students who are studying, studying law. And this Stabat Hall or Stabat Hall was for legal studies or for the meetings of professors and students who were actually specializing on law. So all other sciences, math, medicine, astronomy, in one hall, on the left, in the left part of the Archigymnasia, and only law in the other part of Archigymnasia. Isn't that strange? 
Okay, we go on. We continue to Piazza Maggiore. If you remember, that was the first open space in the whole Europe, <coughs> which was created at the beginning of 13th century. We have Basilica of San Petronio here. We have Podista, the first mayor's office. And then we have a very long building, which is probably two or three palaces, Accursio, Comunale, e Sala Borsa. At the lower part of Comunale, you can see two eagles. Again, one of them was made by Michelangelo Buonarroti. Then between Comunale and Sala Borsa, you see this very striking feature. These are photographs of um, people who died during the Second World War. And actually their wives and mothers started putting these photographs even when fascists or Nazis were still in the town, the German Nazis. Because remember, that was the German Nazis who brought the biggest problems to Italy during the Second World War. Anyway, that is a very sad uh, feature, but looking at the, uh, the palace, at the Comunale Palace, you can also see the palace on the left. It's an important palace because it stands on Piazza Maggiore, and it is called the Notary's Palace. Again, the importance of uh, the law, of notaries' profession, uh, that uh, the notaries uh, were having a separate palace of their own. These are actually even two palaces combined in one building in Piazza Maggiore. But we go further. We now go to the castle of Re Enzo. Same Piazza Maggiore. Who was he, Re Enzo? If you remember, he was buried in uh, San Domenico Church, which itself is an honor. And he was an illegal son, a bastard of uh, king of the emperor Friedrich II, the stupor mundi. Here is Friedrich II in his court in Palermo. He actually was born in the south of Italy, in very interesting circumstances, and his main court was in Sicily, in Sicilia. Have a look at his um, empire. The orange is the German part of the empire, and the red are the Italian parts of the empire. Uh, he was the super mundi. He was the wonder of the world. He was building this very strange castle. For instance, this, that's a castle in Apulia, in the north of, uh, in the south of the uh, southern part of Italy. All, uh, you know, very strange from geome geometrical point of view. Anyway, he died in 1250. But two years prior to that, there was a little battle between Guelphs and Ghibellines, between Bologna and Modena, actually. Modena is only 20, 30 kilometers from Bologna, probably 40. And this, but during this battle of Fossalta, Enzo, the rear of Sicily, the illegal son of Friedrich II, was taken prisoner. And what Bolognians did, they put him into this castle and he was kept there for 23 years. They would not let him go even after Friedrich II offered them a thread of gold which would be as long as the walls of Bologna, which were actually the longest in Europe. Anyway, they really admired, uh, they kept uh, the answer here with all the owners and everything, but the fact that they never let him go actually put the end to the whole dynasty of Hohenstaufens, because he was the last hope. All others died or actually were never elected uh, emperors, and that actually started the problems with uh, the actually the uh, institution of emperors for another 100 or 200 years until Habsburgs actually came to the throne of emperors. Anyway, during Friedrich II times, one of his adversaries was the Pope. If you remember, Popes and emperors, they never liked each other, especially during the 400 years of fight between Guelphs and Ghibellines. In a, uh, Innocent the fourth, or in a chance the fourth, uh, he was actually uh, called Sinobalda Fieschi. He was born in Genoa, uh, died in 1254, four years after Friedrich II. And um, uh, he was a student at the University of Bologna and later on a professor at the University of Bologna, the professor of law, of course. So what he did in 1245, he created the concept of persona ficta, a legal entity. We're all using limited companies now, corporations. So technically, originally, that was created by a pope. Okay, a lawyer pope, but still by a pope. And what he was saying during a collection of uh, church uh, 
people, uh, clergy, uh, in 1245 in Lyon, he was saying, look, a persona ficta or nomen intellectual doesn't have a soul. It cannot be communicated. A legal entity is separate from physical persons, from natural persons, from individuals who have created this legal person. Really, this is the foundation of all corporate law. And it was done also because he was protecting the rights of the unions of clergy people, but also unions of students. Because what started happening after Authentica Habita was adopted in 1158, the students who were living in Bologna, who were studying in Bologna, started uh, forming their naciones. These are really the unions of uh, students coming from different parts of uh, Europe and Italy. The nationals were called Intramontani e Ultramontani. Intramontani, the Italian nationals, Ultramontani, German, French, Spanish, and so forth. We will be speaking later on about the, the Spanish college, one of the oldest and still existing nationals. So nation was a legal entity which was only then later on, a number of nationals were unified into university. And what was Nacione doing, the legal entity was doing, they were employing the professors, the teachers. And that was called the Bologna system, when students of their legal entities were employing their own professors. It is opposed by the Paris system, where, which is called magistrorium where teachers were actually forming their own unions and then uh, providing services to the students. And these two important things, these two important events, the adoption of Authentica Habita in 1158, strengthened by the idea of Persona Ficta 100 years later, actually they gave birth to the real universities from legal point of view. We remember that Bologna was the University of Bologna was started in 1088, but really the habit gave its legal rights in 1158. And look at these figures. 1167, Oxford. 1134 to 1218, Salamanca, third oldest university in Europe. 1209, Cambridge. And 1222, Padova or Padova, fifth oldest university in Europe. So the creation of the legal foundation for universities was really made during the struggle between popes and emperors in the northern part of Italy. Now, another two or three uh, minutes walking uh, along the, uh, across the center of Bologna, we go to the, we come to the two towers, which are actually the symbol of Bologna, Azinelli and the lower one and ugly one, Garizenda. If you go up on Azinelli, 97 meters, you can see this little square called uh, Mercanzia, Palazzo Mercanzia. This is a beautiful palace, which is actually the Guild Hall. You know the Guild Hall in London? So that's the Bologna's Guild Hall. And when you go inside into an absolutely fantastic hall, you can see the coats of arms of four of all guilds. I think there are 18 of them. But at the top are the oldest ones. On the left, jewelries, then notaries, then drapers, and then um, <laughs> butchers, of course, butchers, sorry about this. So the guilt of notaries was the second one to be created. It was so important. Excuse me, there's probably too much light, strange enough. Anyway, continue. Go back onto the square, the square of Mercancia, and there is this tower. Do you know what? This tower, or rather the land underneath it, was uh, bought by Uga. Uga, one of the followers who went to the Diet of Roncalia, 1158. And only in one book on um, Italy, it's oh, on, on the history of Bologna, it says, this was the bribe money. The emperor bribed those four lawyers to actually prove that emperor had more rights than the cities, although giving some rights to the students. So it's very, very dubious. And only one, only one author on the history of Bologna actually calls this bright money. But anyway, 
if you read about those four lawyers who went to Rancalia, you still have to judge for yourself. Did they do something good? Did they do something bad? No, I don't know. Anyway, we pass the two towers. We go into Zamboni Street and Zamboni Street, very quickly, we approach the center of university life, of the present day university life, which is called Piazza Verdi, of course, of the composer. On the left is uh, Teatro Comunale Bologna, one of the biggest opera and belly house, um, uh, theaters in the whole of Europe. On this square, you can see lots of concerts or just uh, students relaxing, especially during warm days. And on all streets of Bologna, you can see people uh, scenes like this, groups like this. This is a student wearing uh, this rough olive uh, uh, tree, olive tree leaves, uh, when he actually graduates uh, from the university. And it could be uh, <laughs> when he actually defends his diploma. He gets his... Uh, uh, diploma, he gets his uh, award and uh, he um, has a little party and we have been seeing this party, they are very nice parties and students are always uh, beautiful, young and they usually wear some placards which tell shortly about their work, what was their work about and that's really very, very sweet. We go further, we go here where we come to the Poggi Palace. Poggi Palace is the actual center of the university, the headquarters of the university starting from 18th century. So the headquarters of university moved from Archi Gymnasia to the Poggi Palace. And on most of the uh, university buildings, you won't even see the word university or Università de Bologna. You will see Alma Mater Studiorum, the mother of studies. Okay, that's Katia and me in the one of the um, rooms of uh, chambers of the palace and uh, the palace has three or four very interesting museums. One of them is anatomical, uh, the museum of physics, chemistry and so forth. But we are more interested uh, in the museum of students. This is called MEOS, the European Museum of Students in Palazzo Poggi, third floor. On the one hand, it tells you how the Naciones were formed. That's, for instance, uh, how the German Nazione was formed. And you remember, these were legal entities who were actually employing uh, the professors. And it also said, uh, just explains to you that uh, students got quite a few rights and not always they were using them properly. For instance, uh, sometimes stealing, uh, you know, some people's wives. Uh, sometimes drinking quite a lot. And here we're quoting the famous uh, meo est propositum in taberna mori. So the well, happy days of students' lives were really, really founded by three events which happened in or around Bologna. First, Matilda's lawyer Irnerius starting to study, to teach law in Bologna in 1088 which is considered to be the beginning of the university, the foundation of the university. 1158 is Authentica Habita, the law which gave rights to the students, all the rights and exemptions, which is very important. And 1245, Innocenza the fourth, the actual creation of the idea of legal entity, uh, the persona ficta. Uh, well, students <laughs> had some time to enjoy themselves. And uh, for instance, uh, this song is very, very famous. It's part of Carmina Burana, a collection of poems and songs written in the 12th, 13th century. That was written by a gentleman called Archipoet. And he was a poet at the court of Frederick II. Again, we're coming to the emperors. He lived uh, and uh, worked in 1130, 1165. And uh, this confession, starts with, I'm resolved to die in a tavern, so wine will be closed to my dying mouth, will sing gainly the angels choir, then may God be merciful to this drunkard. Well, uh, in Latin variant, um, Archipoet was playing with the word, sit Deus propitus huic potatori. Potatori is a drunkard, peccatori is the sinner. Of course, angels should be praising God for mercy on sinners, peccatori, rather than on drunkards, potatori. Anyway, we've told you about uh, students' lives. Thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye. If you want to contact me, the, my and Katerina's email is here, Grishans at mecom. Nice and simple. Grishans, plural, mecom. I'm Josh Grishan on Facebook. And of course, you'll be hopefully listening to my um, setups um, or my, my 
um, pieces on YouTube. Thanks a lot. And we'll come back to Dania. Probably we'll drop Bologna for a few months to come. Thanks a lot. Bye.